This is the Anastasia Rishkova podcast. Today I had an inspiring and transformative conversation with an incredible photographer who specializes in headshots and photographing people's essence. He's passionate about helping people uncover their natural gifts and talents. Please welcome a dear friend of mine, Andrew Bicknell. Hello uh-huh. again, and we're ready. <laughs> yes. So we just checked the video. It's amazing. The quality, everything was working perfectly. I'm very happy. Wow. Yeah, I know. So I just wanted to say uh, quickly before you say anything. There's a. It's not by coincidence that I wanted you to be my first guest. Um, and it's because I really feel that if not for you, this podcast wouldn't even happen. I wouldn't be talking and I wouldn't even be writing. And I feel like you do a lot. You do that a lot for a lot of um, young women, mostly, but young people in general. (laughs) (laughs) And I'll I'll explain that because that sounds a bit (laughs) strange. So you are a photographer. How long have you been a photographer for now? Well, I suppose probably officially since I was about 16, so um, 57 years. Wow, that's amazing. But you went off that path a little bit. You had a few other adventures, and then you came back to it later in life, didn't you? (laughs) Yes, um, I always had a nice camera, but... um, I think I really just lost any kind of idea that I was artistic. Yes. <clears throat> because when I grew up, talent meant somebody like Mozart. It didn't mean an ordinary person who could have a knack for something or anything like that. You, you were told not to be a silly boy and go to the back of the room or something. That's right. So. <laughs> You know, uh, I was specializing in art, which was kind of helpful with photography, but I was told I wasn't ever going to make it because commercial art was not in the art master's mind. Right. Who told you these things? Is this your parents, your teachers? or No, the the art master that I've been working with for seven years. Of course. Because in my last year, I decided I probably wasn't suited to fine arts per se, as I understood it. I didn't know much about anything, of course. But... um, (laughs) I thought perhaps I I might be a better commercial artist working with advertising agencies or something of that nature. I really didn't know Mm because there were no there was no guidance. So I um, when he told you know when he lost interest me I I basically thought that I wasn't good enough for anything. Yeah. So I ended up joining the Merchant Navy and. uh, seeing the world and trying to make a living. But that must have been fun too. I mean, you've probably learned a lot from being in the Navy. Oh, yes. I mean, there are lots of lessons that you learn. They, they, they Basically, they taught me to be a man instead of a boy. Yes. Responsibility. <laughs> yeah, responsibility, accountability, discipline, all sorts of things like that. And... Um, you, you know, I saw the world. I'm multi-talented, as it turns out. So I, I saw the world. I was used to, able to use my different talents to survive and do quite well. Uh, but I largely let my art go. Yeah. Because I had no faith in myself. Mm. I didn't think it was any good. But you, did you feel always like drawn to the artistic side of yourself, even when you were in the navy? Um, yeah, yes, I said, well, there was a creative side to me that would come out in other directions, probably. Right. But, um, no, I just completely lost, um, motivation and faith in myself as an artist. I just thought, no, that's it. It's it's stupid to think about it. And you just shut that part down in yourself. And when did you come... Mm, sorry to interrupt you. When did you come to New Zealand? When I was 23. Mm-hmm. So that was 1968. 
So did you come to New Zealand by boat at first with the Navy and then you decided that this was your home, this was your place, this is where you're going to live? Or how did that yes, happen? Think, no, that's right. Um, I came here first when I was 18 years old. I went to Nelson. Yeah. And I really liked it and I thought this is, this is like England before it went crazy. And I thought I'm going to get away from the northern hemisphere and the bombs and the yeah. Well, let's just tell everybody. Qu sorry, let's just tell everybody quickly where you actually come from. So you come from. How do you pronounce it? Torquay, England, right? Is that correct? Yes, that's right. That's where. South if anybody knows, that's where they filmed um, that funny TV show with the hotel. Yeah. yeah what's that yes. called? <laughs> Uh, faulty Towers. Faulty Towers, yes, that's right. So it was yeah. a holiday place where you come from yeah. in England. Yeah, Fam a famous holiday resort. Mm. And then you just moved to a different holiday resort to live in New Zealand. Yeah, I started off in Dunedin as a home port, didn't like that very much, and um, before long ended up in Auckland. And it was just mm. like a very similar kind of lifestyle to, to Torquay. Yeah. Uh, lots of yachts and boats and water and beaches and things. Only better than Torquay. Mm -hmm. Nicer climate, much warmer, much nicer in the water. The people didn't expect you to have a double degree and gosh knows what. You were just accepted as uh, you either have a good attitude and you're a good worker or you're not accepted. And I, I was a good worker, yeah. had a good attitude, so I was readily accepted. Well, I feel like New Zealand is still that way. You either responsible and you're a good worker and you're accepted by the society, or you're not. You know, there's a word that Kiwis use. I feel like the most out of every English-speaking country that I've visited so far, every English-speaking person that I've spe spoken to, we use the word "useless" for a person. Yes. And at yes. first, to me, it was like, why would you call a person useless? That's very. Um, it's just mean. <laughs> But yeah, it is it, me. But it makes total sense. Yeah, that... yeah. It, well, it, it, it was, uh, I suppose there were three million people when I came here. Yeah. Uh, there were no new cars. You had to have second-hand old bangers and try and keep them going. Um, new cars could only be purchased if you had overseas funds. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's pretty backward. I think if somebody had a refrigerator, they, they were doing very well. Wow. Wow. Well, it makes sense that these terminologies, where they come from in New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I liked it because it was away from atom bombs and nuclear war and it was away from the terrible crowds right. in England and the pollution in Europe was shocking. Nobody was doing anything about it. So, you grow up in... Well, you didn't grow up in the in the wartime, but you were quite young when uh, the war just finished, right? I, I was born at the end of the war, right. yeah. right. and um, I remember as a like a little nipper, I can remember them still having searchlights in our street, mm. and um, basically guns still around in case something happened. It, it didn't all just disappear straight away. So I did grow up with quite a bit of military around the place and of course our cities were bombed out by the Germans. Was Turkey affected? Turkey, Turkey. <laughs> was no, Turkey Tor affected? Tor mm -hmm. Turkey was hardly annoyed by anybody. I think somebody shot up some school kids with a machine gun one day when they were going home but wow. other than that not. Hmm? Wow, what do you mean by well, that? They, like somebody in England, well, an English pr well, person? Yeah, no, what would happen would be when the Germans were trying to oh, escape the Spitfires and the stuff that were chasing them, they'd, they'd unload, they'd, to get more speed, they'd unload. And they'd just unload on anything they saw. So if there was a school of kids and it didn't matter, they'd unload their machine guns, get a bit of extra speed up because the weight was down a tad. Mm -hmm. uh, and off they'd go across the channel and our blokes try and nail them. Yeah, that, that's really terrible. I mean, in times of war, really the worst of the people comes out, doesn't it? Yeah, they're totally disconnected. They probably, the German soldiers, um, pilots probably hadn't slept for days themselves. Uh, they were just on automatic kind of reflex, same yeah. as our guys would have been. 
they didn't have any sleep either. So people were just reacting. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we can't say that either side or or anybody at the, you know in the times of war was a bad person per se it's just that it, it's what you did it's just survival it's just survival or you know, like you said somebody's... reaction yeah I'm, I'm quite sure i'd be the same if i was trying to survive i'd fight for my life and i'd do whatever i thought i had to do to try and survive and keep my family alive you know those sorts yeah. of things you just do them because that's what's inherent in us all. Yeah, absolutely. I saw. But, uh, yeah, mm. so it was, England was pretty exhausted for perhaps 20 years after the war ended. Yeah. Very few jobs, very few opportunities, and uh, just worn out. Mm -hmm. And New Zealand was a lot nicer than that, I can tell you. Now, what, what did you like most about New Zealand when you first arrived? The fresh air, <laughs> yeah. the clear skies, um, the feeling that you could be alone if you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do that in England. There were too many people. Even if you're in the middle of moorland, somebody would turn up with a horse or a dog or something. <laughs> No, you couldn't. <laughs> you couldn't escape people. Absolutely. And what did you do in New Zealand when you got there? Uh, well, the first two years I worked for Union Steamship Company as mm -hmm. a navigating officer on their little ships going back and forth to Australia. Mm -hmm. Then after that, I tried to get a job in, in civilian life, and it was the middle of a recession, so it wasn't very easy. Yeah. But in the yeah. end, I got a job working as a telephone sales clerk for a company, uh, an engineering company, and I was selling big industrial electric motors and things like that mm -hmm. for about six months. Then I realized the company that had a head office in Christchurch didn't know what was happening in Auckland, and they were hopeless. <laughs> So you came uh, in to save them. <laughs> so I can do it. You know, it was just hopeless. So in the end, I was approached by somebody in the life insurance business, and um, and I thought at the time I thought I'm in danger of becoming a jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. Which just basically means I could do pretty lots of different things, but not excel at anything or do anything particularly well. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't keen on that idea, so I thought I've got to persist and do something because I, my naval qualifications were worth nothing. My experience was worth nothing. So I'm basically starting like a 17-year-old, but age 24. Yeah. You know, I.e. straight out of school, no qualifications. Well, I mean, right now it's a common story for 20-year-olds not to be not to know what to do with their lives, even if they're out of school, you can't find a job that's um, related to your degree in any way, and you you might sure. not even like your degree anymore, but you're paying off those loans. Yeah, so sure. you're you're telling a very common um, common story for. All. Yes, I I wasn't qualified for anything that was available. Yeah, right. <laughs> except for the life insurance business because they were desperate to have somebody. Mm. As they are. I, <laughs> yeah. So I thought if I can survive five years, um, then I will learn persistence and determination and uh, focus and things like that. And uh, I should be quite proficient at the end of five years and I want to kind of whack myself into some kind of shape for the future, so that's what I did. I spent five years and uh, uh, taught myself some valuable things about how to live and persist and do things well instead of being distracted by lots of different things. Right, what do you mean by that? Well, if you're multi-talented as I am. Mm -hmm. As you are. Lots. And I know that you are because, well, first of all, you had so many different professions in your life. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. 
Well, if you're multi-talented, many different things interest you. So you go down lots of different roads because they're interesting. Mm -hmm. But you don't become good at anything because you get a little way down a road and say, oh, well, I think I'll go down this other road because it looks more interesting down there. And you keep on going down all these interesting little roads and they all lead you kind of round in circles because they're actually not taking you where you should be going somehow. Do you think unconsciously maybe you were avoiding that path that you should have been going to like that path of the work of your life like photography because because of the things that have been said to you when you were younger that you no, you can't do it so you you probably didn't even think about that back then that you could possibly accomplish that all I knew from society in general was that it was extremely difficult to make a living as a photographer. And I had that reinforced everywhere and, in, and anywhere. Mm -hmm. And these days in Auckland, you try and make a living as a photographer and you might say, that's not going to happen. It's difficult. It's very difficult. It is very difficult. But, yeah. yeah. So you do have that reinforced. And I don't know you necessarily avoid it, I think. You just had to be a bit more realistic about the fact that if you if if you want to have a home and a family and do those kinds of things, then you have to find a way of earning some money so you can save some money so you can put a deposit down on a house or an apartment or something and <laughs> build a home of some description, you know. So that was locked and loaded and I had to find a way to do it. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't going to happen if I was taking happy snaps around the place. That's true. And um, so what did you do after that? Um, well, I um, got myself a, a good job as a um, technical representative for a um, packaging company. Mm -hmm. And they would design folding cartons for products like, like for example, this. Yeah. Or, or perfume boxes or chocolate boxes or cereal boxes or anything at all. And they had lots of different types of patterns and designs that they could make. And my job was coordinating the carton designer with the commercial artists, with the dye makers, with the printers, with the coordinating it all and making sure if possible they arrived on time for the customer to put his products in. Now you mentioned diamond makers. So yeah. is that the job that helped you get into working with the jewelry? Yes, I, I was working um, I was working for the packaging company and, and one of my customers uh, was a manufacturing jeweler. He was a, quite a famous goldsmith in New Zealand mm -hmm. and we used to supply him with special little handmade jewellery containers and boxes and things. And uh, he said to me one day, he said, uh, my reps resigned. And he said, I like the way you've been taking care of us. If you take care of my customers the way you take care of me, uh, I think I'd like you on board. And I, and I said to him, well, I'm happy with my current job. Uh, and he said, I'll make it worth your while. I'll make it worth your while. So anyway, he said, how much do you want? And I told him how much I wanted. And he said, yep, no problem. So I started working for the manufacturing jeweler as his rep around the country. Mm hmm after three months, we got a massive, we were hit with a massive new tax that stopped right. New Zealand manufacturers in their tracks and he fired me because maybe redundant because right. I was the most, I was the highest paid guy and the sales just stopped. So I had needed a job and so I got the Herald, New Zealand Herald newspaper <laughs> and I kind of found about 50 jobs that I thought I could do. So I applied mm -hmm. for them all and uh, got offered quite a few. And one was the industrial diamond tool business. 
And the guy who just made me redundant said, oh, that's a good business. You should get into that. Yeah. So I got into the industrial diamond tool business. That's interesting. When you were looking for the newspaper, looking for jobs, um, can you tell me what was your method of looking? Like for somebody who's in the same situation as you were back then. Yeah. Who yeah. Um, is, has made redundant or lost their job, but not yeah. sure what they want to do in life still, and they just need to have any job, but they want, yeah. they, they want to be good at what they do. So what was the methodology that you were using? Well, in the life insurance industry, I taught myself persistence and determination. Mm -hmm. So I was well equipped not to give up looking for a job. Well, that's important. I think that's the number one, that's the number yeah. one rule when you're looking for a job. Yeah. Yeah, people get demoralized very quickly and easily. Um, but but I, I had been from hundreds and hundreds of interviews where the people didn't want to be interviewed. Interesting. They did not want to talk about life insurance. Okay. In fact, I was thrown off a few doorsteps, you know. Right. <laughs> People I had appointments with. <laughs> because when I got there, it turned out that the wife had made the appointment and the husband wasn't happy about life insurance at all. So get, go away. That's, a, that's an interesting situation to be in. Oh, it happens a lot in the life insurance industry. Yeah. But anyway, I was used to rejection. And dealing with feelings of rejection and overcoming them and, you know, knocking on another door or making another phone call or whatever. And so I just went through the newspaper looking at all sorts of different jobs I thought I could probably do. Mm -hmm. Some I could do some at a push maybe, but I thought I could probably learn how to do it. So I just um, contacted every one of these companies and I thought the law of averages will help me. If I see enough, if I find enough companies and interview, get interviewed enough, someone will offer me a job. Yeah. Because they, they wanted people. They were advertising for people. So I thought someone will like me or something. So I just went for lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of interviews. And you weren't afraid to be rejected, like you said. And how did you deal, how did you learn to deal with rejection? Especially as a young person. Because you were quite young when that all was happening, wasn't it? You were, You would be... What, about 26, 27, oh, okay. 27, oh, okay. 28-ish. Um, we read a lot of self-help books. Okay. Like mm -hmm. Think and Grow Rich, The Power of Positive Thinking, Psycho-Cybernetics. Yeah. We used to read all these books all the time because mm -hmm. it, it reinforced us. It gave us sort of hope. And by we, you mean your generation? No, the other guys in the business like me, oh, they were quite right. a few of us. We were all struggling. To find yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah. We would talk to each other at weekly sales meetings and talk about how difficult it was with various people and what had happened. And then other people would talk about their successes and... You know, but basically we were sort of propping each other up psychologically and saying, well, look, you're not the only one who's getting thrown off doorsteps. I, I was thrown out the other day, you know, whatever. And you'll have a laugh and diffuse yeah. it and neutralize it. It must have been so amazing to have that kind of support. Um, and so important yeah. probably to, to have that support from the same, same sort of people. Now, I know because I know you. And you've talked about it a lot, that Psycho-Cybernetics, the book, has made a yep. huge impact on your life. Would you yep. mind talking a little bit about that? And, um, yeah. Sure. Um, when, you're, when you're finding it difficult to survive in an emotionally and psychologically hostile world, um, you kind of read anything at all you think will help to perhaps um, improve the way you th you're thinking or improve your morale or improve your sense of hope, That's things like time. that. Okay. Um, so this book turned up and... Um, it had some interesting reviews, 
and it was basically the beginnings of self-image psychology, which these days is fully accepted and utilized in, in, by psychologists and people. But in those days, it was emerging, mm -hmm. uh, and a psychologist wouldn't have known anything about it. He would have thought, that's just a lot of rubbish. But this, the writer of the book basically Now, what was his name again, sorry? Maxwell? Maltz. Maxwell Maltz, okay. Well, yeah, he was a skin, he was a, um, derma, not a dermatologist, he was a... Um, he was a, um, a surgeon, I believe. Yeah, a plastic, plastic surgeon. A cosmetic surgeon, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> he simply found that many of his patients would come for different improvements to be made to their faces, etc. And uh, the people would say to him, look, I'll be happy when I've got a new nose or I'll be happy when my lips are full or I'll be happy when I've got more, ch uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. But they'd have the operation and be successful. They wouldn't necessarily be happy. Yeah. And he was an ethical man and this disturbed him. He didn't like putting people through all sorts of quite tricky operations and things with, with some risk uh, with, without having a positive outcome to it, that they were happy and delighted with their new looks or whatever, see? And this disturbed him and upset him. So he found himself in Germany for some reason or other, and um, that's where self-image psychology was emerging. And uh, he studied it and uh, started to employ the principles in his practice. Mm -hmm. So what he discovered basically was that we're creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. And that if you can create more desirable habits than ones that are limiting you, then you had a chance of growing and being more successful in your life, you know, in the ways you wanted to. Uh, so um, in the end, after quite a few years of practice uh, using this, he wrote a book called Psychocybernetics. And essentially it taught you the habit of happiness. Right. How to change your perspective, I think. And changing your perspective is yeah. what brings, what can bring you happiness in your life. What, what can aid in bringing you happiness, sorry. <laughs> I think he helped with all that stuff because all of a sudden you had some nice simple tools you could use that would progressively, by small steps, help you. You know, it was a small step process. You had to do exercises as you read the book. Yeah. And um, if you did those exercises and brought them into your everyday life and got into the habit of monitoring your thoughts and improving the quality of your thoughts on the fly, then, then gradually the, the process in which you made decisions about what was happening in your life became enriched by more encouraging self-talk. Right. So, for example, let's say you start off, you start reading the book and you're lying in bed and you're thinking about what you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Going, oh, I'm not very keen on this, you know, because you might be thinking, oh, I'm not very good, I failed at that today, um, you know, I don't think they want me. Uh, I don't think I'm good enough to beat the, you know, the other guys who are applying for the job, things like that. Uh, and you become aware of the general tone of what you were, how you were thinking about something. And then you think to yourself, oh, I think I can improve that a little bit. So you wait until a thought came into your mind and you'd sort of assess it and say, no, nah, that's not good enough. I'll add a codicil to that. I'll add a little tail to it. So if the thought was something like, and these are usually thoughts that come back again and again, um, the thought might be something like, um, I don't have any energy today. Mm -hmm. I've That's been a good too example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good example. Yep, sorry. Yeah. I've been beaten up in these interviews. I'm just getting nowhere. I feel hopeless, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then you could say, yeah, I, I was feeling that, but, you know, 
I know that this is just temporary because I'm going to add a little something to the end of that which says, but I'm getting a bit better at the way I think about things. So the next time I'm not in such a good space, it's going to be better because I've already acknowledged that it's just part of my new journey. And you kind of talk to yourself these little add-on thoughts to what you were thinking. And gradually, 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 you do this automatically. A thought, a negative thought will come into your mind and subconsciously you'll grab it and you'll say, that's not much good. You assess it, you grab it and you replace it with something which is more encouraging. So if you're thinking, I'm not very good at arithmetic, you grab it and you go, I'm not very good at arithmetic. <laughs> that used to be the case, but I'm much better than I used to be. Right. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. So you're essentially reprogramming your brain to think more positively. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, what you're beautiful. doing is you're becoming your own supportive best friend. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. You're supporting yourself in a habitual way rather than relying on somebody coming along and interjecting and saying, oh, cheer up. Yeah. You're gradually, gradually giving yourself the strength of self-support. That's what you're doing. And it mm -hmm. works very, very well. But you have to keep at it. Yes. And it's so important, especially in a society where we've grown, well, at least where I've grown up, uh, you know, you hear all these things that you should be not bringing yourself down, but you should not be egotistical about yourself. You should not, um, you know, you should remember that other people can be better than you. <laughs> and that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. There'll always, always be better people at certain things, but no one can be better at being uniquely you. Mm -hmm. You're uniquely you, mm -hmm. and you're the you're the best in the world at being uniquely you. No one can beat you at that. Yeah. And that just changes That's, everything. It, you don't have competition because they can only be fake versions of you. And there is no competition. Right There's there. no competition. If you're true to yourself, that's what you bring to the world, and it's a package of gifts that you were born with. And when, you, when you're impassioned by using those gifts in your life, you live, you don't exist. Most people mm. in the world are existing. But when you live with your talents as you do, with your writing, your poems and everything like that, you're living the life you were designed to live. Mm. And that's a wonderful thing. That, so, that is a wonderful thing. <laughs> you have no competition. You are you. You write the way you write. You feel the way you feel. No one can compete with that. People don't necessarily like it, mm -hmm. but they can't compete with it. Hmm. It's like, I got this, you got that. It'll be different. So it has a competition. Absolutely. Well, you know, one thing I learned from, um, so we just traveled with my parents around um, beautiful, absolutely stunning European cities. And my family, we like museums. So we stopped by lots of museums and looked at a lot of art. And what I've realized is that you can't like all art. Even though nice. it could be a masterpiece, it could be an absolute um, famous painting by Van Gogh or um, the names escape me, Monet, anybody, anybody else, but it just doesn't resonate with you. And it's not supposed to. And that's no. fine. Not everything that you do will resonate with everybody. No, it won't. Yeah. Mm. It so, will not. And it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. So you use a lot of these um, wisdoms when you when you photograph. And just quickly about your photography. So you've been working a lot with Miss, previously with Miss Universe, Miss World. Um, is it Miss World now that you working you were working with? Or Miss well, Earth? okay, you tell yes. me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sometimes through photographing Miss World contests and things like that, uh, Miss Universe contests, um, you you get to meet young people who um, 
are energetically drawn to you because <clears throat> they somehow instinctively understand you have something that will help them. Yeah. And um, yeah. On, for my part, I inst instinctively understand when somebody can benefit from some of the stuff that I've learned in life. And I've come to learn over the years, and I think people do. If they're going to learn, they learn as they get older, I suppose. But <laughs> <laughs> you learn to <clears throat> you learn to give um, because it's wonderful to see other the effect on other people, to see them growing, to see them more happy, or seem happier. I mean, uh, things like that. Um, you can see them going down a road they should be going down with, are going down using their talents. Mm -hmm. In fact, lots of young people need to be helped to identify their talents because they don't know they have any. Uh, right. Half the kids in New Zealand aren't brought up these days. They're just dragged up. Right. They're not brought up. They're not educated and helped. So they have had no guidance worth talking about apart from rubbish on the television or something. Mm -hmm. And what do, you, what, what do you mean by the difference being brought up and being, how did you put it, dragged up? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> in the days before computers, televisions, laptops, cell phones and things like that, families would talk a lot more together. Mm -hmm. They would have mealtime together as families and there'd be lots of interchanges of stuff going on and uh, if one of the older kids or a younger kid was struggling at school or something they might talk to the younger kid if the parents didn't have time and things like that so there were there were awful lot of communal interconnections that you don't have if you're isolated to a one of these. Mm, it's like a disconnect. <clears throat> it is a disconnect. It's mm. a disconnect from humanity. You have some sort of some sort of connection going on, mm. but when you see people walking down the street and they're all using these instead of talking to each other or being with each other, you sort of think, what the hell is going on? Mm. Uh, you, you know, there's a feeling of closeness is lost and closeness helps give you support when things are difficult. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know it. yeah, definitely. Sorry to interrupt you again, but I mean, oh, right. we talk about it a lot and we always say that there's huge benefits in cell phones and other technological devices, um, but it's the way that they're used. But I think one thing that we always say to each other that is funny, that even if the aliens were to fly above their heads, we wouldn't notice them because we would be on our phones. Well, yes, I mean, That's right. how, many, how many times it's a little joke do, that we have, yeah. I, do I have people walking in front of me in the car, in Takapuna, for example, just walking in front of the car completely unaware of the fact that my car is there mm -hmm. because they're not looking. They're, they're completely engrossed in their little whatever it is they got. Yeah. And they got the, their headphones in. They're, they're completely oblivious to sound. To motion, it's just, you know, and you come along and all of a sudden they look up and they go, oh, there's a car coming <laughs> towards me. Yeah, it's just it's like, dangerous. <laughs> it's like they're dopey. Yeah. I, yeah. We talk about dumbed down people. This is, why, this is a way of dumbing people down so they don't feel and they don't know anything. Mm. It's not, I mean, it's not people's fault, per se. Well, it is for letting themselves be dumbed down. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Well, one thing is interesting because I, I feel like that's more of my generation, but what I'm seeing in my sister's generation now is a total change in that because they've grown up with cell phones. It's not a new and exciting um, no. device. It, it's, it's normal to them. This is what it always been, and you can see that they're... Well, I can't speak for the whole generation. I'm clearly generalizing. But what I see in her and her friends is that they want to be out more. They want to be together more. They want to spend more time 
actually connecting with people. But what do you think is the solution for being more present and being just what be use your phone less? I think you have to learn to leave your phone at home for a few hours. Yeah. And learn to live again without constantly being on alert to people who are not actually in the moment with you. They're somewhere else. Mm. You're in the moment in another situation with other people and constantly you're getting people horning in on you all the time. Yeah. They're no business being there. It's like, go away. <laughs> I'm with my friend. I'm walking along with my friend. I don't want to talk to you about the party tomorrow. Mm. It's a gross intrusion of your privacy to constantly have phone calls and texts coming at you when you're trying to have a nice time with your friend. Well, exactly. You're having coffee and having a conversation. Well, the one problem yeah. is, um, yeah, the one problem is that we feel that we have to respond immediately to yes, that's all right. the emails and all the. One thing I've been trying to do lately, and I mean, I'm not perfect. I'm clearly addicted to my phone, and I'm trying to get better. But one thing I've been trying to do is when I wake up, not to touch not to touch my messages and my emails for at least an hour. That's very good. <laughs> yeah, it's been difficult <laughs> because you get curious. You just woke up. Well, who imagine. has messaged me? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a certain stimulus, I suppose. Um, but I think it's good to be without your phone for a while mm -hmm. and just um, start to, to understand again that everything's fine. Yeah. Well, here's an example. When I was studying psychocybernetics, I was living by myself on a, in a little cottage out in the, in the Wop Wops, and I had a lot of time by myself with my dog. And um, I had a lot of time to think and just be me, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And the thing was that... <clears throat> You, you have a choice about how you're going to create a quality mind, a mind that can give you quality results because it has a good basis from which to grow The potential. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And it's... It, it, it's a little bit like being a farmer. If a farmer um, says, so I'm going to grow some nice organic crops in this field or something, he's going to prepare that field mm -hmm. for the crops. He's going to till the soil. He's going to put fertilizer in it. He's going to test it to make sure it's the right acidity for what he's going to plant. Uh, you know, he's going to try and grow things that are appropriate to the climate that they're in and all sorts of things. So he'll go to a lot of effort to make uh, his crops grow really well. Mm -hmm. So when he plants those seeds or whatever, they're going into an environment where they can grow very easily and healthily and quickly and with lots of energy because everything's right for them. Now, when you think about thoughts, mm -hmm. if you allow thoughts, if you think of thoughts as being seeds, if you let those thoughts or reinforce those thoughts or perpetuate thoughts or strengthen thoughts, positive ones, in, a, in an environment where they're not being negatively knocked around, they will grow more rapidly and more easily into a harvest of what it is you want. You're putting in some seeds and you want a harvest. You want a big harvest, right? Mm -hmm. So if you put those seeds into acidic soil that they don't like, they can't, they can't give you a lovely abundant harvest. It just won't happen. Mm -hmm. And if your mind is like that. If your mind is full of negative rubbish, it can't give you the harvest of um, that you get from really good thoughts. It can't because 
they're not in the right environment to, th to flourish and, and, and things like that. So, for example, one of the things you have to do when you're studying all this is you have to go without any new news media for a year. Mm -hmm. You don't get newspapers. Is that what you did when you yeah, were... Absolutely. I didn't look at television. I didn't. I avoided, at all costs, I avoided any contact with politics, the outside world, anything to do like that. Was I it, just got criminal. Right. Was it difficult at first? Yeah, it was because I'd find myself in the habit of looking at a newspaper, the headlines right. or something, and I'd teach myself not to. Yeah. Uh, but after a while, I realized that I was actually quite happy because I wasn't getting all this horrible stuff into my head all the time. Mm -hmm. Because you think about most of the stuff in the newspaper, on the television, all these other news sources, it's mostly tragedy, disease, upset, war, famine, all the horrible things that happen to people, not all the good things that happen to people. You're not fed that. You're fed yep. awful stuff. You are, so, definitely. Yeah, you eat this awful stuff mm -hmm. and you make a poisoned mind and hope that these beautiful seeds of thought that you sown are going to flourish. How are they going to do that? Mm -hmm. They can't get past all the war, famine, whatever it is that's going on in there. So you stop that. Mm -hmm. And then you're only seed seeding thoughts that you really want to have, and you're growing them by reinforcing them, and if they're getting attacked, you encourage them with little ways of encouraging yeah. them. Gradually, 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 the balance between, if you like, here's a seesaw. <laughs> if, you've got, yeah. if you've got positive thoughts that side, negative side, that side. Hello. Gradually, gradually, instead of Breaking you being like Breaking that up like a little this, bit, we can't see it. Yeah, you come like that. And you come into a sort of a neutral kind of a state for your thoughts. It's not too bad, in other words. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of gradually, 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 your positive thoughts so outweigh your negative ones that you have almost a feeling of euphoria because we're designed to be happy or to have the potential for happiness, but we deny it to ourselves by taking in all this horrible negative stuff. And by doing the sorts of things we're not designed to do. So if you're trying to do things you're not designed to do, you're going to fail a lot. You're going to be miserable, probably. Yeah, because you're failing all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's better to do what you're best designed to do, because mm -hmm. that will tend to be something that is energizing mm -hmm. in a positive way, etc. And, and to cut out all this nonsense. Who cares if Trump gets three Koreans back out of North Korea or something? Who cares? You know, I, <laughs> it's not my work. I don't have to deal with this. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't affect you directly. Even though you might think that you should know these things, really, it's really none of your business. <laughs> it isn't any of your business. What's your business is mm -hmm. what goes on in here mm -hmm. and how you can affect, affect in a positive way, the lives of those closest to you. Yep. If you focus on that, you're much more likely to have a happy, fulfilling life than if you worry about what everyone else is doing to everyone else. Exactly. So how do you think you, find, you can find meaning if you don't know what a meaningful path is for you? you were just how do you define it? How do you, how do you find it? How do you find a meaningful path? How do you find what is, what is that you're supposed to be doing, as you were saying just before? Well, I, I read lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of books on this kind of subject for 25 years or so. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I came to the realization that it was really very simple. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple as whatever interests you, interests you naturally because you're equipped to be able to work in that area of interest. It's a natural function of a human being. 
You can't be interested in something unless you're equipped essentially to be able to do those things or to be in that place. So it's a natural function of a human being. You follow what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And if you want to diagnose things, you can kind of go backwards from the interest and see what sort of talents would generate those sort of interests in a particular subject. You know, you can do that and you can go to Johnson O'Connor Research Foundation where they've studied hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of human aptitudes and how to, dis how to test for them and prove them and the strength of them. Now tell me more about that. What are, what are you talking about here? <laughs> well, <laughs> part of my little journey was to try and find out how you determine what gifts or talents or aptitudes that somebody might have. Mm -hmm. And um, there, in fact, is an outfit in America. It's a non-profit organization called Johnson O'Connor Research Foundation. You can find them with Google easily enough. Yeah. And uh, there, I think they started out being industrial psychologists trying to improve the morale of workforces and the productivity of workforces in factories and things like that in, in maybe the 20s. And um, out of that has grown this nonprofit organization throughout America, about 20 branches or something. And they've, they've been able to, to define hundreds of unique talents that a human being can have. Wow, I've, I've never heard about this before. Yeah, well, most people haven't. <laughs> but it, this is it's, amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. So you can actually these days um, pay money, uh, go and have two or three days with them, mm -hmm. and they'll put you through a battery of tests. Um, some will be, you know, do you have finger dexterity, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, all the sorts of things you would never think of being a talent, but they are, in fact, talents, because some people – are ham-fisted, they can't do little delicate things. Right. And other people can do extremely delicate things. They have wonderful control over the most... So, you Yeah, know. that's true. I actually know somebody who, um, who has been doing, I think, first as a hobby, now she's selling um, her little art. that She, she makes tiny little art, and people, are, people yeah. love it. <laughs> yeah. It's great. It's like, microscopic stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's right. So anyway, they test for all these things, and they'll say to somebody, okay, what we've discovered is you're very strong in these areas, not so strong here, but modestly strong in these areas, not much here, not much going on down here. And the kind of professions or occupations that would use these sorts of talents and gifts are these. Mm -hmm. And they can give you a whole bunch of places where you probably find a home you are quite comfortable in. Mm -hmm. And it can, it can be like, instead of spending a lifetime searching and not having any guidance at all, not having any psychosybernetics, not having any, anything, just trying and failing and trying and failing. It's a long, takes a long time to try and fail and try and fail and try and fail and try and fail. And try and fail until eventually maybe you stumble upon something that you don't fail at. <laughs> you know? But this way, they say, well, we know that you've got great structural mm -hmm. visualization. Mm -hmm. We know that you're able to put together words in a way that, uh, you know, whatever. And, and they tell you all about yourself. And then you can say, oh, okay. So you start trying to get into these professions to find out if, in fact, you are a round peg in a round hole. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you're trying to do. You're a round peg and you want to find a round hole for yourself to fit in nicely, right? You don't want a square hole. Correct. <laughs> Correct. You won't fit into that. Well, it's, I feel like that's a very important program, program because, for instance, the way that I grew up is to – there's a distinction between there's work and then there's hobbies, and those two don't correlate because the work brings you money, brings you a certain yeah. lifestyle, and then yeah. hobbies is just something that you do with that money that you made and the free time that you have. But that's false. 
Yes, it that's is. That's not true at all. That's not. Oh, it's, it's not true. My father used to say quite the wrong thing to me. He would say, don't let your heart rule your head. Do Which not. Is the opposite <laughs> of what you opposite. should be saying. Let yeah. your heart rule your head. Yeah. Yeah. So right there you want to obey your father and you're trying like hell to kind of not let your heart rule your head, but your heart is you. Yeah. It's your uniqueness. It's your unique powerhouse of talents and skills that are there for you to discover and use in your life, to give meaning to your life. Mm. And you're being told, don't do that. You know, get a job, get a proper job, make some money, you know. Absolutely. Don't think about happiness. Don't think about achievement. Don't think about the possibility of regrets. Mm -hmm. You know, Francis has some interesting information on the regrets of the dying. Now, wait, Francis is your wife, who's an amazing medical doctor in uh, Auckland, New Zealand, just for people who don't know. And I I do hope that we'll do a podcast with her as well. Well, I think you should. I think I should. Yeah, she's very interesting. She's um, an integrative, uh, was it integrative? Yeah, medicine. Yeah. Medicine. Yeah. Yeah. She likes to use any form of healing that has evidence. Mm-hmm. She won't she do anything has. that doesn't have evidence. No, she won't. She does her research, but she very broad. Yeah. And very capable and very good problem solver. So she's got. You can mm-hmm. literally define that she has problem solving skills. Mm-hmm. She has communication skills. She's got a, 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 an ability to focus and keep focusing until she gets to the heart of a problem. So, you know, there's a determined, there's sort of like a character thing, which is she's determined to get to the bottom of things. It's, I don't know how you would define that as, a, but there's probably a bunch of talents to make that thing up or something. Yeah. But she's a very talented girl, multi talented, definitely. She does not consider herself to be an intellectual at all. Really? Not at all. Oh, I didn't she know that. <laughs> she just thought, oh, what am I doing at university? You know, you know, uh, well, how come they've accepted me? I'm just a, an average girl, you know, and I've got all these brains around me in university. They're miles better than I am. They're like, they're, they're. But in reality, her, her beautiful mishmash of skills allows her to do things that the brain boxes couldn't do because they don't have the same skills that they can bring to bear on solving a problem. They have other skills, but not the Mm. kind you need when you're trying to solve health issues. She's got a very mm. big, big toolbox. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that, especially, well, I consider her one of the best doctors in New Zealand, if not the best, and I haven't seen all of them, but I've seen a lot of doctors. New Zealand, and I think she's top notch. She is top notch. Yeah, yeah she should be in the if there's if ten percent of the doctors in the country are first class, <laughs> mm-hmm. she's in the top two or three percent. Well, just to say how top notch she is, we can um, I can ask you how old you are, and I think people won't believe. I'm seventy three soon. Yes, exactly, seventy three, and you don't look it. <laughs> That's you good. don't look anything close to 73. Hmm. Well, that's what I am in, in June. Yeah. But it's only a chronological age. It's not my energetic age. You know, if you want to live a chronological life, mm-hmm. you can be a slave to preconceived ideas about how fast a body should age and what happens to you along the way and how you're no longer able to think after the age of 70, I don't know. Exactly, exactly. Like I was saying, my parents were just here and they can't stop telling me that I should have kids because it's time, because I'm getting old. I'm 26. Um, I'm not getting old at all because I'm getting old because things will happen and it'll be more difficult, which, you know, I mean, I can't blame them. They have their ideas about life, but I just don't agree with it. I think if you have a, if you live a very healthy life, you'll be fine. You can yeah, and have they been talking to Harry about <laughs> his prospects with his 36-year-old divorcee? No, what happened there? Well, 
Well, the point is that she's 36 and you're 26. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think it hasn't crossed Harry's mind that she may not be able to give him the children he'd like to have? Because she's 36. Mm. Because if she's never been pregnant before, How are we her chances of it. Hmm? Oh, the prince. Are we talking about prince? Yeah, Harry. <laughs> Who's Harry? See, this is, I don't watch the news. This is this is how far removed I am from it. Oh, that's um, good. Hey, Prince yeah. Harry of England, you know, and he's yes. got an American divorcee. Oh, uh, right. Fiancé who's 36, and he's probably contemplating having a nice family or something. Hmm. But if she hasn't been pregnant before, it's well known that a woman's fertility after the age of, I don't know, mid-30s has dipped a long way. And yeah. she may not find it easy to get pregnant because it's, she's left her run too late. That's true, but with technologies nowadays. Well, yes, of course. There are but ways. Those, mm. those technologies can depress women. They can send their hormones up the pole and drive them absolutely nuts. That's and true. they don't know much about that. They just give the woman all these hormones and then tough. Yeah. They just want those eggs and sperms together. That's true. It's and interesting. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you again. Uh, about hormones. Um, that's interesting again because that's one thing that Francis, Dr. Francis Bastillas, uh, she's very, very passionate about is hormones and she's very correct about it because if, you, if your hormones are off track. Um, oh, you have a terrible time. You, you, you will. You might have a depression and you might not know sure. why. And it's because maybe you've been eating the wrong foods, sleeping, Absolutely. not sleeping at all, stressing, and so yeah, take your hormones, salute. guys. <laughs> it happens a lot at university because students start off studying subjects that they have no natural talents for because some well-meaning person has said to them, oh, you must do law, uh, you must do commerce, you must do that, you must do that, you've got to do maths. And they're arts people. Mm -hmm. And they start failing like crazy, but they were top of the school in all their art subjects type activities. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, what's happened to me? And, and they, their confidence takes a huge hit. And there's a lot of depression in universities. That and now they don't sleep, they get depressed, they don't sleep, they almost go to hell. The next minute you've got a burnt out young woman that you're trying to bring back from the jaws of death. I like that. Because well-meaning people have said, go and do what you're not equipped to do. Then you'll be happy. That's not true, like we said. Well, anyway, um, we've been talking for about an hour. So we might... Oh, really? Yeah, we might, yeah, I know. Time goes by quickly when we talk to each other. Yes, it does, um, yeah. Yeah, so um, just to wrap up, if anybody wants to check out your work, your photography, how can they find it? And what's the best way? Oh, I'll link well, everything just, down. Hmm? Just go to Facebook and look yeah. up Andrew Bignall. Easy. Easy as that. Easy. Or www.headshot.co.nz. Yeah. There's a website with lots of headshots on it. Mm -hmm. And you mainly specialize in headshots. Is that correct? You prefer yes, yes, because I have a set of talents that enables me to connect with the person I'm photographing and to capture a lot of their unique energy. Mm -hmm. And that has a different dimension to photographs. You capture the person, not just a face. Yes. And, and so communication skills and energetic skills and all sorts of things like that come into it, and I'm fortunate enough to have that kind of bunch. Well, it's your interest. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know I had all those things. Yeah, and if um, if somebody does want to have a photo shoot with you, they can just do the same thing, find you on Facebook and just message you, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Lots of people do. Oh, there it's you go. The easiest, it's the easiest way because I'm using Facebook all the time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Absolutely. But not a lot of people realize the um, immense power 
and confidence and, and all the many benefits there are from having really good headshots taken of them because it can provide so many insights to a pers prospective employer or someone like that just looking at a person and feeling their energy and seeing them and they almost know that person before they've even met them. Mm -hmm. These are very powerful things to give to somebody. They're a wonderful thing for someone to use in their life. It's like saying, this is me. Yeah. Can you tell from this <laughs> photograph who I am? And, of course, people can. And they can. And you, um, you do photograph like that. You really photograph people's essence. I try. I do try. Yeah. Oh, it does uh, come through. <laughs> okay. Well, I photographed you and I captured your essence, I'm sure. Oh, I have lots of wonderful, wonderful photographs from our photo shoots. Lots of. I'm very pleased that you've got those. Me too. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you so much for doing this with me. And it's a pleasure. I hope it worked. I, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure it's just just great for the first podcast, but um we'll do it again sometime soon. Maybe yes, once I have my microphone going and things like that. Yeah, so, yeah, well, you sound pretty good from here. Yeah, I think so. Well we'll just check the sound and it's been good. Well anyway, thank you for that. See doggy in the background there. There is a doggy in the background. It's always in the background. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting impatient for attention. Oh, always. Aren't they always impatient for attention? Okay. Yes, they are. Yeah. Okay. Well, lovely to talk to you. Lovely to talk to you, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Yes, and, and we're planning a trip to Austria before too long. Yes, you you must. We'll talk okay. about it. Okay. Okay. Bye. 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 -bye.